John chapter 13, John chapter 13, verse 12 through 15. I'm going to read out the, the New Living for you. It says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Most of the time we only think we have two ordinances in the church. Communion, which we just celebrated together, and water baptism. But I say we have three. I say foot washing. That's what we say in the country. Foot washing. Feet washing is an important act to demonstrate where you're at on this journey. And I'm gonna say this, if Jesus could wash those jacked up feet, I think you and I can do a better job as well. Let me pray, Father, thank you for leaving a towel behind that we can pick it up and practice the example in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, as you get in your seat, look at somebody and tell them, say, pick up the towel. Pick up the towel. But in a very, very like real unique place with Jesus of late, where, you know, the admiration for him just seems to have gone to another level for me. I just find myself just really looking at his character different, focusing on some of the attributes of who he is and find myself being mesmerized and pulled into a deeper place of affection with him than this season. Maybe like no other, my time with him has just been really awesome. But it's also really convicting because I'm, I'm recognizing how much I'm not like him. Even though I admire him and I want to be like him, I had this, this thought going through my mind about, you know, I just got these, this thing, you know, with some people. You don't, I, I do, you know. And I, I was just having these thoughts and I'd put people in a category. And, and, and so, you know, if you seem to appear like this stereotype that I had fabricated, then I was already assuming things and I just had this bias that was developing in my, my, my heart and spirit. And, 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 and Jesus said to me, he says, I don't feel towards them like you do. I, I don't think about them like you are. I don't see them like you see them. I heard that so loud in my spirit. And then, I mean, I broke down and I thought, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm not like you. I want to be, help me. That's, that's what I said, I said, help me, Jesus. Help me to see people like you. Help me to care like you. Help me to love like you. Take this biased, unhealthy perspective that I have of people sometimes and strip it off of me like an old garment and renew my vision towards people. And let me, let me embrace what you're calling. It's, it's easy to not deal with yourself. It's easy just to be so familiar with how you live, move, and have your being that you don't allow the character and the nature of Jesus to reckon with you. And, 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 and sometimes it's, you know, I, I pray. I, I mean, I have a, a decent prayer life. I, I'm, I'm, I'm meditating. I'm, I think about the word. I read the word. And I, and I have a decent study life. I'm a, I love music. I'm sure I drive the entire team crazy with, especially Matthew because I'm never on pitch, I'm always out of key, and I just roam through the hallways of the staff area, belting out phrases. To me, I sound just like the original artist. But, <laughs> maybe like caterwauling to them, I don't know. But, it, but, but I, I love to worship. Worship is like this vehicle that I jump in to express myself emotionally towards the Lord, etc. But here, here's, here's the, um, the deceitfulness of it. 
is that because I do those things and I'm assuming that I do them more than most people do, I give myself a pass in other things that may not be as reflective towards the nature and the character of Jesus as it should be. And I can assume that he's okay because I just cried in the office with him alone. So maybe he's not as concerned because maybe my tears satisfied my relationship with him and he don't care that I have a bias and a prejudice towards, towards people. And I won't even let it reckon with me. I found out in this season, I've been like trying to be quiet and think about how I think and deal with it and, 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 and be okay that I'm being discovered and what I'm seeing is maybe not as good as I thought it was be, be, because it's not running him off. I'm amazed that he's still with me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrown by him. I don't get him at all. I really don't get him. The Bible says he knows my thoughts are far off. I'm embarrassed that he knew him yesterday. And he still knows what I'm going to think that is nothing like a man of God should think. And yet he says, I'm not checking out on you. I'm not leaving you. I'm not forsaking you. I'm going to go with you always. I promise you. I promise you. If I knew what you thought sometimes, I ain't going with you. I ain't got the grace for your craziness. You ever got around some really spiritual folks and you thought, I hope they can't read my mind. You ever been like that? I watch prophetic folks because prophetic folks will pick up something and even though they can't read my mind, they'll be looking at me and I'll be thinking, did you just pick that up? Did, did you get that? I hope not. But yet Jesus knows it all and has still done it all. And I'm amazed by that love. And I don't want to be familiar with it. And I don't want to be passive with it. And I just don't want to live on the plane that I've been living. If there's another level of experience with him that I can have. And I found out that the only way that I can have deeper experiences is, is when I'm challenging myself to mimic his behavior more. And the more I mimic him, the more I become like him, and the more I discover these things about him, they put me in a different place. And if you're not mimicking him, you really don't know him as well as what you thought because you can talk to somebody on the phone but have no idea who they really are. It's different sitting at the table. It's different when they're in your bathroom with you. It's different. It's different when they're sitting on the chair and you're laying down at night. It's different when they're in the recliner beside you watching what you're flipping on. It's, it's different than just picking up the phone occasionally and say, hey, what's up? How are you doing? I need some help. Can you send me some money? Can you deal with my crazy spouse? Can you help my children? I need a new job. I'd like to get a better car. Boy, I'd like to have that house. Can you really forgive me? I just blew it. Please forgive me. It's, it's, you, you know, it's really a one-sided relationship. It's like I just need more than what he's already done because sometimes what he's already done is just not enough. Uh, it's just, just not enough. I need some more. And my relationship can get really yoked in that. And if I'm not careful, especially in the body of Christ these days, I can let my situations become my doctrine of who he is and what he'll do. And when it's not conducive to the things I want him to do or the life that I'm striving to live in, I can just simply throw in the towel. I can just quit. I can't take no more. And I felt like the Lord said, said to me today that there's going to be a lot of people here tonight that are in a place where they just simply feel like throwing in the towel. Throwing in the towel is a metaphor from boxing where, where, where the guy in the corner, the coach in the corner 
has this towel in his hand, and when he thinks you've taken all you can take, he'll, he'll throw the towel in the ring and say, stop the fight. My guy can't handle it any longer. And I have seen uh, some cases where the fighter himself has just been beaten round after round after round, and he's sitting on his stool in his corner, and he tells the coach, he says, throw in the towel. I, I can't take it anymore. And we have some families today that, that the wife is saying, I'm throwing in the towel on my husband. I, I just can't take his crazy anymore. He's just not here. And we have some husbands that says, I just can't spend another night with her. We've been through so much. It just stays alive. And I'm wearing the scar. And he's throwing in the, the towel. And some of you have some adult kids who have stolen from you and who have taken from you and, 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 and robbed your house. And, and you've just got to the end of your, your rope, if you will, and you're throwing in the towel. And a lot of us in this place tonight have just been beaten up by life and life circumstances. And we're just saying, I, I just want to throw in the towel. I, I don't even know. If God was who he said he, then I wouldn't be going through this. I thought you said the battle is yours, not mine. Why am I feeling like I'm feeling going through what I'm going through. Jesus, for me, is the guy that if anybody could have thrown in the towel. See, most of us are fighting so we can win, if you will, something for us. But if you're always only fighting for what you can get, uh, here you go, enough will never be enough. And you'll quit on people all over the place because people are a resource for you to extract what is necessary in order to get to where you want to go. You are your favorite face to look at. You are your favorite face to look at, right? Check out Instagram. Check out Facebook. Look at social media. We're a selfie world. Everybody trying to get a picture of themselves. And, and, and by the way, guys, I'm weirded out by it. I don't understand. Will somebody please help me understand why these men are shooting pictures of themselves in the mirror? I don't get it. What, what, what? Oh, you wanted us to think how handsome you was. Well, you married. The only person that needs to know that is the one you're going home to. Go home and give her a little FaceTime instead of the rest of us and we'll be, yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm messing around. I, it's Good Friday. If anybody, <laughs> that's it, be good. Yeah, the 11 o'clock service this past Sunday didn't go well. I was glad Jules was not present in the service. <laughs> I, I was really had something powerful all of a sudden and I just slipped my mind. If anybody could have quit because of what he was going through, what he was facing, it was Jesus. It, the reason he didn't quit, let me put it in three categories for you. Number one is because of love. Love caused him not to quit. Love is the driver, if you will, for him. Hey, check this out. Last things matter most, I think, right? What you're doing when it's at the end, what you say when it's at the end speaks volume to what you value or what you regret. One of the two, all of us are reaching a place and we look back, oh, I regret, I wish I could have, wish I could have, wish I could have, or we're rallying people around so we can maximize, make the, make the most of. And one of the things that I thought, I think kept Jesus from throwing in the towel is he loved them 
John 13, verse 1, it says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. That knowledge, he had done picked up, this is it. He wasn't a stranger to a crucifixion, by the way. Jesus was not the only person who ever died on the cross. Thousands of people died on the cross. When he is teaching during his ministry, he's saying, take up your cross and follow me. He has a reference point, an illustrative sermon, because everybody knew what he was talking about. Because crucifixion was so common, so brutal. How would you like to be living in a sense of freedom, but knowing that at this particular time, they're gonna do you like you're seeing them do others. The terror that could take hold of the heart as you looked at the brutality of the cross and thought, they're gonna do that to me. I bet he heard the screams of some who had been hammered to the tree before. I bet he watched families wail and cry and gasp for air from the depth of the grief that they were experiencing. I bet, I bet he was very familiar and yet he was facing the same fate and all of a sudden the scripture says it's Passover and he knew that the hour had come. This is it. This is the last night that I'm alive in this physical form on earth. And then it says this, and he loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he had loved them to the very end. Love kept him. Love kept him. And I love the fact that he communicates so graciously because we should communicate love. It's great to hear, I love you. You shouldn't have to wonder where you're at in relationship with people. And Jesus is awesome about communicating his love. The disciples knew where they stood with him all the time. They never had to doubt where the relationship was. Even when they're not living up to par, even when he has to get in their business and tell Peter things like, get behind me, Satan. Or even when they're not picking up on the ministry and he just got this little bit of frustration. Guys, how long do I got to be with you? How many times do I got to keep telling you this same thing over and over? But love gives you courage to not throw in the towel and say, I got to find another way to say it. That's why I he has so many different parables in scripture because he's driving the same message over and over and over again. He's telling it as many ways as possible with the hope that somebody will catch it and it will get on the good ground of their heart and produce the fruit of the kingdom. Let me tell you, sometimes simply saying I love you can break the suspicion that's in the heart of those that are around you and maybe give them some fuel of hope. But this is not dead. Say it. Tell your kids you love them. Say it. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm not proud of everything you do, maybe, but I'm proud of you and the potential. They need to hear that. Because we can spend all of our time correcting, but if you don't balance the correction with an expression of love, they may assume that's where you are in the relationship and they might not find the love in the correction and just simply think it's abuse. No, he was great at communicating it. And love is emotional. I love his vulnerability. His willingness to just be emotional about it. His willingness to simply, the Bible says that, that he wept, he cried. That he would get over, overwhelmed with compassion for the people. Most of his ministry demonstration of power didn't come from a place where he's just trying to get everybody's attention. No, in John, John chapter 8, it said, and he was moved with compassion. Man, you want to cause the power of God to express through your life in faith? Huh? Let it be moved by compassion and love. Faith worketh by love. There's something about love that when you want to do it, not because you need a book deal, you need an audience, or, or you need a celebration, but you're groaning inside of you at the condition of the people that you see around them. No, it'll move you. And people love to, to, for you to be touched with what they're touched with. And he was great at it. But love can't only be a spoken word. It can't only be an emotional moment that we experience together. With Jesus, love is deed. It's action. 
It's communicating where I'm at in this relationship. Not only, here you go, in word, but in deed. That's what verse John says, love not in word only. Yes, say you love me. Tell me you love me. Let me know where I'm at in the relationship. But if you do love me, love is working on my behalf, not yours. Your love works for me. If you're only loving me in order to extract something from me, that's not love. That's manipulation. No, no greater love can a man or a woman have than to lay down their life. Now, the reason why Jesus doesn't throw in the towel is because love compels him. I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing it for you. He was in glory in the beginning. He wasn't trying to get back to heaven. He was trying to make sure you got there. And love caused him to continue. Next, this is another thing that I think that kept him from throwing in the towel. He served them. John chapter 13, verse three and four says, and Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and he was going to God. And then it says this, he rise from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. He put off his fancy woven robe Been wearing that everywhere. You remember the one that they wouldn't part just to get the fabric, but they cast lots to keep because it was Gucci or Armani or something. (laughs) It was fancy. And if anybody deserved to have fancy, it was Jesus, the king of glory, right? But the Bible says he laid fancy aside. He laid title aside. He laid identity aside. And he got up and said he girded himself with a towel. When you girded yourself in scripture with a towel, it means I'm ready to do some work. When you girded yourself, it meant that I'm ready to engage. I'm ready to do something. And there was no greater servant to humanity than Jesus himself. And on the last night of his life, when he could have talked about anything, shared anything, went anywhere that he wanted with whomever he wanted to, he decides to have dinner with his 12 amigos and share some stories and be an example because they're caught in the conversation at dinner over greatness. Oh, their conversation is they're arguing at the dinner table over who's going to be the greatest. And the greatest is sitting at the dinner table. And they're in competition with who gets to sit where and what seat I get and who Jesus loves more. And in the midst of the conversation of greatness, of greatness, he wants to demonstrate it that it's found in servanthood that it's found in serving humanity. And so he gets up and the Bible says he gets a bowl of water and he pours it in a basin. And then then, then he calls somebody, I got somebody coming. Where are you at V? Come. He calls somebody. Now listen, he's got 12 guys at the table. He's He's got a guy like John at the table. Please V. If you wouldn't mind, remove your shoes and your socks. I hope your feet are clean. (laughs) So so, so, so he goes and, 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 and he gets John at the table. John, the lover. Right? Here, here's, what the Bible says, here, here's what the Bible says about John in John 13, 23. He says, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Talking about John. I mean, if I'm going to wash somebody's feet, I mean, it's not a problem to wash John's feet. Check him out. We've been running together. When we're up, John's always in my space. John loves me. 
John will be the last dude standing when it's all said and done. He outlives the other 11. He's the last of the disciples. Hey, Jesus had taken time with him. He was like in that inner clique, that, that, that team of three among the 12. And, 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 and the Bible says, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, they, they were close in. They were, now listen, if I'm going to wash John's feet, oh, that's just some, why not? He's been serving me. He's been on this journey with me. He's been loving me. He's there when nobody else is. Right, you remember that on the night that Jesus is rested, it's only John that's going to where Jesus is going. Only John. Everybody else. It's only John. John's the guy that Jesus entrusts with his mother. I mean, John becomes the caregiver of Mary, the mother. Oh, I don't have any problem washing your feet. Not at all. I appreciate all you've done for me. I appreciate you being there for me. I know that you're going to be faithful. Not everybody else is going to be faithful, but old John boy here. Yes, he is. I don't mind. This is, this is like a brother. I, I could touch him. I don't mind handling him. Yes, John, look at that. Look how clean they are, John. You're my boy. I mean, the guy that's going to lean on his breast, the guy that is meaning so much, the guy's with him, the, the guy that's going to write the book of Revelation, that's going to see Jesus like nobody else sees. Sure. It's not even much effort washing somebody's feet that is doing so much for you. Thank you. But, but, but John wasn't the only guy there. John's not the only guy. There's some other folks there. there. Peter's there. Come on, Pete. Peter's there. And, 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 and let, me, let me tell you about Peter. Peter is the, the denier. Washing John's feet is one thing. Washing the cat who you let walk on water. Who you took up on the mountain of transfiguration. Who was in the room with Jairus' daughter. And yet you are telling him, listen, uh, Satan is wanting to sift you like wheat, Simon, but I'm praying that your faith won't fail. Because I know that when the rubber hits the road, you think that you'll go to prison with me and you'll die for me, but I know you a little better. You're really a denier. You're, you're, you're really a, a denier. And when the rubber hits the road and the young damsel is questioning you about your relationship with me, you're going to throw a cuss fit and say, I don't even know, dude. I don't even know him. Leave me alone. I've slept on the ground at night in the wilderness. I listen to Jesus snore. Or Jesus listen to you snore. One or the other. He's the denier and yet he's willing to serve him, the denier, like he is the lover. He, he, he's, he's willing to get in his mess Like the guy that looks like he's got everything going on. But, 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 but not only is the room filled with a denier, check out, we got some more cats in there. We got doubters. The room's filled with doubters. <laughs> Notice in the conversation taking place, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know whether, where you're going and how can we know the way. Thomas, the doubter. The guy that's been listening and just not getting it. The, the guy that's been following and yet not picking up on the direction. Uh, the doubter. The guy that Jesus will have to appear to personally in order to believe the message that he has spoken unto him face to face. 
about raising up. Jesus has resurrected. The disciples come to Thomas and they say, he's risen. He said, I doubt it. He was good at ministry, but I'm certain he didn't raise from the dead. And Jesus is not only willing to wash the feet of the denier, but he's also willing to wash the feet of the doubter. But, but he's not the only cat in the room either. There's a whole group. There, there, there's some more. There's the denier, the doubter, and those that can never see it and don't want to see it. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices thee. What? How long have I been with you, man? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Oh, I don't equate you guys to being the same thing at all. I need to see something else. I haven't seen enough. Dude, you've seen Lazarus come out of the grave after four days. You carried some, you carried some hush puppies and fish sticks throughout a camp of 5,000 people and fed them and watched that multiply in your head. Don't you remember the leper? Don't you remember blind Bartimaeus? What are you talking about? You need to see something else. And yet, he still got the towel. Still willing to go the distance. Not only are they the, those that can't see it, those that are doubted, there's the runners. <laughs> when the going gets tough, the not so tough run. That's Christianity today. People have no staying power. Jesus said in Luke 16, verse 32, he says, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that you shall be scattered and every man to his own and you shall leave me alone. And yet now I'm not alone. The father's with me. He said, when they smite me, none of you boys are going to be found. What? It's my last night and I'm going to grab the towel and touch the feet. It's the place we spend a lot of money trying to cover up. And some of you ladies need to, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a. <laughs> That's another thing about men. I'm not going to say it. I know you're trying to be GQ. I, I'm just going, I'm, I, I heard the Lord say, just pull up, Anthony. Just pull up right there. Don't talk about man, men getting pedicures and manicures. Just, just pull, just pull up. I come from the country. Get you some toenail clippers and clip them and dig the dirt out and go on about your business. I'll do what you want. <laughs> he said smite the shepherd and everybody is going to scatter think of that I had walked so intimately with him I had proximity to the king of glory I mean would you oh one night at that campsite in the wilderness oh what I would give to spend one night sitting around the fire with him Listening to the grace and truth roll off his lips like honey. Oh, and they got the gift of being there night after night when the crowds went home. I mean, they're in the green room with him. They get all the answers behind the scenes and yet he says, you're going to run away and you're going to leave me alone. And yet he is still willing to wash their feet. I mean, he's saying, I'll touch where you've been. And what you've been walking through, I'm not afraid of. What's stuck on your life, I'm willing to get it off. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm going to get it. I know that you're not perfect. 
I know it's not always going to be great. I know that you're not always going to rise to the occasion of the expectation, but I love you anyway, and I'm not throwing in the towel. No, he, he washes. He cleans. Such care. No, it's not just John that gets touched. It's the last night. And this is what you want to do? Shouldn't you have done this when you started? No. I want to show you guys something. And with all these, he's still got another cat in the, in the clan. He's got a betrayer. He's got a guy that has been complaining about money from the get-go. He's got a guy that watched a woman graciously break her alabaster box and pour it over his head, and inside he was mad, burning with indignation, mumbling and complaining. Why? Listen, he said, why are they wasting that on him? What? They, Judas was ridiculing The woman with her alabaster box, we could have sold that and helped some poor folk. He wasn't worried about poor folk. He had the money bag. He just wanted his wallet fat. And when Jesus stopped making his wallet fat or his bag big, you know what he did? He sought somebody else that would do it. He knew Jesus had some enemies. Well, I, I get it. Washing John's feet. Oh, I, I, Peter just had a moment, but he wept bitterly and repented over it. And Thomas would thrust his hand in the side and his doubt would be obliterated. And those that ran would find themselves running back and gathering, but not Judas. Not, not, not this guy who's a part of the 12 too. Not the betrayer. Have you ever been betrayed? It's violent. It's vicious. Having let somebody into the inner recesses of the secret parts of your life and expose yourself very vulnerably to them only for them to exploit you for personal gain. I'm going to wash your feet. I don't think so. No, I ain't. I ain't touching his feet. Not because I'm fully aware that he's about to leave in a minute and go to the high priest and he's going to initiate that crucifixion for my life. Am I washing your feet? The devil is a liar. But that's how I would be. That's not how Jesus was and is. No. No. He treated him with the same love, care, tenderness. He gave him the same access to the messages and the demonstration of power. He sat with him at the same table and broke the bread and gave it to him as John, the guy that loved him. No, no, he humbled himself. Washing feet was for the servant. When you went into a person's house, the owner of the house didn't wash anybody's feet. He had someone that was enslaved to him for whatever reason it was who was working on his behalf. And that person would have the job of touching the mess. Jesus gave up heaven's right for humanity's humanity's humility. And he washed his feet. Here's what I want to ask you tonight. Which one are you? You're one of them. You're the doubter. You're the runner. Circumstances are right. You'll be the denier. In moments, you'll be the lover. Sometimes you'll be scattered. We don't know where you're at. 
Life will get difficult. Which, which are you? Which, which are you? You know what I want to tell you? Thank you. It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've denied, what you've ran from, what you doubted, what you betrayed. He loves you anyway. 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 He has not thrown in the towel. He's not thrown in the towel. Because love plus service plus humility equals an example. And if you want to be deeper in God, you know what you have to do? Jesus got up. He took the towel off. And the Bible says he set it aside. And he went over, sat at the table, and he says, I know you're wondering what's going on. I, I, I know you, you wonder what's going on, but I want to let you know that if I am master and Lord and have washed your feet, don't you live your life jockeying for position trying to be great in men's eyes. If you want to be great in my eyes, pick up the towel. Pick up the towel and go find somebody that's a betrayer, that's a runner, that's a liar, that's a denier, that's a deceiver. Are you here? That's not wanting to believe, that needs proof all the time, and touch where they're at. Because if you do, it might not solve all the moments that they have ahead, but at the end of the day, they'll find themselves right back to the room. See, servanthood provides a gateway, not to perfection, but to access to who Jesus really is. One of the things that I love most about him is not just simply that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, but the way he loved and the way he served and the way he walked in humility. He wouldn't have been on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. He wouldn't have been looking for applause. He would have been looking for peace that got stuff on their feet and he would have invited them to sit down and say, I don't mind touching where you've been. Let me clean those feet so I can send you where you need to be. We must pick up the towel. Come on, stand to your feet.